This morning, Ellie Thomas is going to come and help me and um, quote to us the first six verses of Hebrews chapter 3. Jesus is greater than Moses. For every house. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Thank you. Give Ellie a hand this morning. Thank you, Ellie. I shared Wednesday night, the primary reason I'm doing this, primary reason I'm doing this is to provoke some of you to jealousy. <laughs> if they can memorize those portions as they're doing every week, you can do a verse or two in your lifetime. So, so put that on your agenda for the year ahead. Been talking about Jesus is better. He's a better Savior. First week, better than the angels. How many are glad that we have a Savior who isn't the angels, that Jesus is a better Savior? And the warning that came with that in chapter 2 was that we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention. And chapter 3 continues to challenge us, warn us, because the, the touchstone is Jesus. He's the cornerstone. Everything builds off of him. How should we respond to this better Savior? And chapter 3 says to not let your heart get hard. How many of you know it's easy to let your heart get hard? I'm telling you, I'm seeing um, some things happen, obviously, in this coronavirus era that I've never seen before. Uh, never imagined they would come, the churches would have to shut down, and I get all that was involved in that. Never imagined that I'd see the Capitol stormed, whatever you believe about that, and whoever was behind it, it's a whole other story. Just never believed I would see that, and I never believed I'd see the rise of people who don't like people in ministry. People in ministry don't like people. The, the tide is rising. I had another pastor talk to this week who said, I, uh, something's wrong with me. Right now, I just don't like people. And it's easy right now to be caught up in the anger and the tension and the frustration and let your heart get hard and not like people. It's one indication that your heart is hard. I um, started to post something on Facebook and then talked myself out of it. But some people just irritate me. They just do. And I'm just going to tell you, I do not believe that you have the right to an opinion on everything. Some things you have no right to an opinion. Former um, young man grew up in our church that's gone on an alternate lifestyle, did a big blast on Facebook, know the young man well, that most pastors are driven by money and power. And I just thought, you don't have a right to that opinion. People who aren't doing it have no right to tell those who are doing it how to do it. You don't, you don't deserve an opinion. And when you're uninformed, when you're ignorant, you don't have a right to express an opinion as though you know what you're talking about. That irritates me greatly. <laughs> In case this is my therapy session right now. I'm, uh, you're all my therapists and I'm venting to you. It's, there's a... There's a plague in the land of hard-heartedness. And we need to be really careful that our hearts don't get hard because of the, I mean, the people that are. <laughs> we need to let our hearts get hard because of what's happening in our world. Christians don't have the freedom to react like non-Christians do. We do not have that liberty. We have to work really hard. And when I... When I've shared this before, but when young ministers ask me what the hardest thing in ministry is, I said this before COVID. I think the hardest thing in ministry is to, is to keep your skin thick and your heart soft. And if it ever was needed in Christendom, it's today to love people, not because of them, but in spite of them, because Jesus loves them. 
And if your heart gets hard, it's going to affect your relationship to God. Scripture warns us over and over again. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 13, Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. What happens with the children of, uh, of Israel leaving Egypt and the armies of Egypt being drowned in the Red Sea? And all that happened was simply because Pharaoh let his heart get hard. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 15, if there's a poor man among your brothers in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted. You see, those go together. Hard-heartedness produces a miserly mentality. You'll become tight-fisted. Zedekiah rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar and made him take an oath in God's name. He became stiff-necked and hardened his heart and would not turn to the Lord. That's what happens when your heart gets hard, you turn away from him. And Jesus said to his disciples, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Why are you talking about that in the feeding of the 5,000? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? If your heart's hard, you're not going to be able to perceive what God is trying to do in us and through us. The Bible says in Ephesians, they're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. It's a, it's a dangerous, dangerous thing. Do you know even the secular world recognizes the danger of a hard heart? One writer said, if the heart is hardened, the intellect is, the intellect is darkened. This wasn't a Christian writer. If the heart is hardened... The intellect is darkened. Think about that a moment. Another one said, the hardened heart will ruin my emotions, my happiness, and my memories. It'll ruin my emotions, my happiness, and my memories. And then a little longer quote, just from the secular realm. We're not born with hard hearts. We're born with soft and tender hearts that more often than not are mishandled and con consequently broken. How many have had your heart hurt because it was mishandled? The pain is always harsher than expected when each fragment turns to stone. So we pile them high to form a wall of protection around us, determined never to experience such terrible pain again. That is how hearts become hardened. Ironically, our refusal to dismantle the wall is how and why we continue to suffer. Out of the hard pieces of our heart, we build walls to protect us. And let me just give you quickly a ministry uh, called Crosswalk, lists seven indicators. Not my message, but I want you to get a sense of what we're talking about, about a hard heart. What are the marks from a Christian perspective of a hard heart? Number one, a lack of understanding. You won't be able to understand what's going on in the spiritual realm if your heart's hard. Number two, bitterness and resentment. That's a mark of a hard heart. Isolation from God and others, withdrawing, not interacting. A refusal to forgive is mark of a hard heart. Indifference, pride, and listen to this, a refusal to serve or be ministered to. It's a mark of a hard heart. Those are the things we need to be aware of. Hebrews chapter 3 says, we have a better Savior, better than the angels. You need to pay attention because chapter 3 then says, he's better than Moses. Now that's as good as it gets in Israel. Moses is the man. He's the hero. He's the, he's the top of the chart. He's what all of this revolves around. And the writer of Hebrews is saying to Hebrews who are being tempted to turn back, you've got to remember that Moses is not our savior. Jesus is greater than Moses. And when you understand our better savior, we are obligated to work really hard to not let our hearts get hard. And I don't know if there's anyone in the house that needs this as much as I do, but does anybody else struggle right now in the culture and what we're dealing with, with your heart getting hard? I mean, it's like, I just, some, some days a spirit of slap just comes on me. Everyone just slap somebody. It doesn't matter who. <laughs> just like to slap somebody. It's, this world is out of control. How do you, <laughs> don't worry. I'll shake your hand. I won't slap you. But I, well, no, anyway. <laughs> Maybe I won't. We need to guard. And Hebrews chapter 3 is all about how to do that. How to keep your heart soft. And if there ever was a word from God 
that our generation needs in Christian circles. I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell you. So I'm I'm gonna prophesy to you. The forces of darkness that hate the church in human form believe they've won. And we need to show them that they haven't. And we won't do it by using their methods. We'll do it by returning evil with good. Kindness for pain and a heart that refuses to get hard as much as they hammer on it. Get ready for a ride in 2021. We're going to need to keep our hearts soft in the world that we're facing today. How do you do that? Well, number one, verses one to six, you fix your thoughts on Jesus. You fix your thoughts on Jesus. The Bible says that he is the apostle and high priest of our profession, of our faith. So what does it mean to fix your thoughts? It means to observe fully, to behold, to consider, to discover, to perceive. It's more than just thinking about him or, or reading about him. It's about fixing your thoughts on him. It's the spiritual discipline of meditation where you just let your mind be filled with how great he is, how wonderful he is, all he's done, all he's suffered, all he's provided. And when you see them spit on him, when you see them curse him, when you see them nail him to a cross, when you see all that happen and hear him say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see him dealing with bullheaded and stubborn, ignorant disciples that don't have a clue what's going on, and then he entrusts the church to them. Let your mind, thought, and heart be fixed on him. See him because he's already walked this road. There was a song popular in the 70s or 80s um, that had a line in it that I just despised at the time and still despise. It said, um, Jesus, you know, if you're looking below, it's worse now than then. Oh, really? How many of you have been nailed to a cross? How many of you have been crucified, spit on curse as the way that Jesus was? Worse now than then. It's different now than then. But he faced a world that hated him and still was, isn't that amazing? Was still able to save from the cross. His disciples had forsaken him. His closest associate had denied him. One of his own had betrayed him. The world has rejected him. And, with, and his father has turned his back. And in the moment of that darkness, he says, Father, forgive them. What a Jesus. Come on, someone help me this morning. What a Jesus. Don't tell me you can't keep your heart tender. Fix your thoughts on him. Fix your mind on him. Because we are sharing in the heavenly calling. And I, and I want you to see this. It's not just that we're sharing it with him. You've got to understand that we are sharing it together. We are sharing together in the heavenly calling. The heavenly calling isn't just about you and your stuff and your needs. It's about all of us together. And that's what makes it really challenging in this COVID era to figure out how we can continue to engage with one another. And we'll look at that a little bit more later. But you have to understand that this faith has a corporate dynamic as well as an individual dynamic. It's not just about you going to heaven. It's about us going to heaven. It's not about you alone experiencing the presence of God. It's about us experiencing the presence of God. It's about the body. And so what's happening in our culture is the body is being fragmented and isolated and separated. And we've got to find a way to overcome that because we share together in that calling. This first part of Hebrews 11 is packed with so much truth. You could meditate on it for hours at a time and never plunge the depths. He's called the apostle and high priest of our faith. What does it mean to be an apostle? The, the word apostle is ap apostello. It means one sent, and it means someone sent from God. Why did he come? Because God sent him to love you. 
He was sent on a mission. He's the apostle. He was sent from the Father to come rescue us and help us. And how is he the high priest? He represents us to God. Not only did he come to redeem us as the one sent from God, he represents us as our high priest. The mediator between God and man is who? Jesus, the one who came. Put your mind on that. Think about how God sent him forever with God in eternity past, forever with God, eternity future, co-equal with the Father, and God sent him to you. Not only did God send him, but God said, you'll represent them back to me. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. So then he says to them, you have to remember that he is better than Moses. Now that's, that was tough for them to swallow. So, yeah, we don't get that at all. We have no context for that. But whoever your favorite person in the media is, Jesus is better. In fact... Some of you old timers, I just want to tell you this morning, Jesus is better than Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Ooh, I'm telling you. He's better than your favorite media preacher. He's favorite, better than whoever you look up to and depend on. Jesus is better. And they've allowed going back to where they once uh, where they once were to distract them from where they should be. And he's saying to them, you can't, or the writer is saying to them, you can't do that because you're going to something less. Any person that you focus your attention on will in some fashion fail you. And so if you have people up on a pedestal that they're the ones you look to, stop it. Don't fix your eyes on a person. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. He's the one that we need to look to. How many are hearing me this morning? I'm talking about keeping your heart soft. I know people have been devastated by the failure of others. One of my, and I, I don't know if this offends you. I'm, I'm sorry. Not that I said it, but. <laughs> Ravi Zacharias one of my heroes in apologetics, and there are charges being brought against him. And I held him in incredibly high regard. But I'll tell you what, Ravi wasn't my savior. When the feet of flesh fail, there's the everlasting arms of the Lord that hold me up. If you see him as the apostle and high priest of your profession, he's better than Moses. So then... He reminds them, which is better? This is hysterical. If you had read this like it really is written, who is greater, the builder of the house or the house? Duh. Well, let's think about that a minute. How many have ever seen a house that you were in awe of? There's one in Ames. I just drive by and think, Wow. Wow, that must take a lot of money to live in that place. They're pla like that. I, Carol and I drove, I've shared this before, but the richest place we ever drove through was in Chicago, a particular area where every house had a sports car, a minivan, and an airplane with a runway between the houses. It was, I just went, and I thought, what I could do for missions with that money. And God said, what are you doing with missions with the money you have? So think of that house, and now you want to build a house. And, and I ask you, well, who's going to build it? Well, I saw a house over on such and such a street, and I'm going to ask the house to build me a house. Now, you know that's ignorant, right? How many, how many know that doesn't make sense? Hold up your hand. You have a second grade education. You can know that that isn't what you would do. What do you want to do? You don't look at the house and say, wow, I want that house to build me a house. I want whoever built that house to build me a house. So who built Moses? Jesus did. Who's built any of the leaders that you look to? Jesus did. Using an illustration that is ridiculous to make a life 
changing emphasis that it is the builder of the house that we need to look to and all of the heroes of faith in scripture do not begin to compare with Jesus who's the builder of the house. So look at what it says at the end of this section. Christ is faithful as a son over his own house, over uh, God's house, and we're his house. How many of you want to be God's house? Okay, we're his house if we hold to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. How do you know? Watch, how do you know if your mind and heart is fixed on Jesus? You'll be confident in your faith. And you'll be steadfast in your hope. Those are the markers of people who have their mind fixed on Jesus. They're, 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 they maintain their confidence and they're steadfast in their hope. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Now, this word fix, one of the commentators I read, I like to read commentators from 100 years ago because they're not caught up in the entrapments of the present age. You get a little clearer sense of the text. And McLaren says that the word implies an awakened interest. What does this mean? Listen, this was powerful for me. The word fix implies an awakened interest, a fixed and steady gaze. And that is almost... The, that is almost the alpha and omega of the Christian life. Doing that is the beginning and the end of the Christian life. So live in the continual comp- contemplation of Jesus, our pattern and our redeemer, is the secret of all Christian vitality and vigor. There must be no languid look as between half-opened eyelids, as men look upon some object in which they have little interest. But here there must be a sharpened gaze of interested expectancy, believing that in him on whom we look, there lie yet undiscovered depths and yet undreamed of powers which may be communicated to us. It's not a half-awake look. It's a fully awake embracing What more can I learn? What more can I see? What more might he reveal to me? That's what the author of Hebrews is calling us to, to protect a hard heart. Fix your mind on Jesus. Second, you ready for this? Because this is going to get a little little, little challenging here. I'm going to kind of step on your toes a little bit, so I'm going to ask your forgiveness ahead of time. You need to learn to listen for God's voice. You need to listen to God's voice. Verse 7 says, so as the Holy Spirit says today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Now, it's really saying to us that we need to today to hear the voice of God. I get that. But I'm convinced from the structure of the text that there is a direct relationship between hearing the voice of God and not hardening your heart, that they run together. Communion with God is essential to keeping your heart soft. You have two choices as a believer. There's only two choices. You either hear him or you get hard. You either hear him or you get hard. You say, well, pastor, I don't know if I've ever heard his voice. Okay, ready? I'm going to push a little bit here because I want you to get this. I don't want to hurt your feelings. But when you say to me that you never hear his voice, you're telling me you're not a believer. Because Jesus said in John, my sheep hear my voice. So if you say, I never hear God speak to me, then you've never really encountered him. You have a religious faith, but not a dynamic faith. Now, I'm not going to leave you there. Don't bail on me yet, but I want you to hear what you're saying. When your confession is, I never hear the voice of God, Jesus says, you're not one of my sheep because my sheep hear my voice. So let's pursue that a little bit. You need to have a mindset that submits and obeys the voice of God. So, think about it this way. I want to take away from every believer the confession that says, I never hear God's voice. What we should say is, I know he's speaking. 
and I'm trying to learn how to hear. Do you hear the difference? Don't tell me he's not speaking because scripture says he is. And you have no right to call him a liar. When you say God is not talking to me, you're calling Jesus a liar because he, or you're not one of his sheep. So what should you say? Because I know people that struggle and I struggle sometimes hearing the voice of God. What we should say is I am learning, I am trying to learn how to hear the voice of God and I'm struggling with that. I need some ability, some help in learning how to hear his voice and there are ways to do that. But let your confession be, I am trying to grow in hearing him. Don't ever accuse him of not speaking. Do you see the difference? Because when you accuse him of not speaking, that will isolate you from him and your heart will get hard. But if your mindset is, I know he's speaking, I just need to learn how to recognize his voice. Because he is speaking to us. When you ignore or disobey his voice, it hardens your heart. So this section tells us that we should seek to enter his rest. Now let me talk to you about Sabbath rest and what it's supposed to be. Okay, it's going to take a little bit for me to unpack this. And I know it's a little more didactic, a little more teaching than sometimes we do on Sunday morning. But there's a point here to grab hold of. Sabbath rest was more than one day a week. So those who say we're not under law and we don't have to worry about the Sabbath miss the whole point of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was um, made for man to worship God in a day set apart. But the Sabbath rest, do you know where that was supposed to be fulfilled? And not that they would then have one day a week, but that every day would be a Sabbath set apart and holy to God. That was in the promised land because here was God's design for the promised land. They would go into the promised land, drive out the enemy, they would possess the land, and they would live free from battles with the enemy and the labor that goes with that and be able to live openly and freely in the blessing of God. It isn't the will of God for you to live in continual battle. He wants you to live in the place of perpetual victory. That's called the promised land. And they couldn't enter into that they were unable to enter into that that place of rest from struggle why because they hardened their heart now it gets to that a little bit more later but in this section right here let me just encourage you that if every day is a battle every day is a struggle every day is a fight that's not where God wants you to live He wants you to live in a place not not of um, denial or foolishness or um, blaming others, but in a place where you enjoy the favor of God every day, regardless of what's happening. Um, There was a teaching years ago called Bridehood Saints, and I just think it's a calling for all of us that we would live in the promised land, seated in heavenly places in Christ, our hearts kept by Uh, with peace and filled with joy you can live there and that's the promised land for the believers today the fulfillment is the enemy's driven out and you possess the land and we have sabbath rest every day in our relationship to god but they couldn't end their end because of their unbelief they didn't believe watch you will never possess more ground in god than you believe you'll possess I know that's simplistic, but you will never possess more land spiritually than you believe you can possess. We're self-limiting because we don't believe that the provision of God is real. I'm talking about keeping your heart soft. It can happen, but, but you have to hear his voice. God wants to talk to you, and often he talks to us in ways that are different than we expect. I've had God speak. I've heard God's I've heard God's voice come out of my uh, wife's mouth. I've heard God's voice come out of books I read. I always hear God's voice come out of the scripture that I read. It's not like I'm sitting around and all of a sudden there's this big booming voice. This is my beloved son in whom I well please tell everybody to listen to you. It's a quiet knowing. 
and he wants to talk to you. Now, if God is telling you whether you should have caramel or chocolate in your latte, (laughs) you are delusional. (laughs) And you need therapy. I listened to a pastor who wanted to walk in the blessing of God and hear his voice. And he walked up to his closet one morning and said, God, I'm going to trust you. What should I wear today? Which shirt? Which jacket? Which pants? And he said, I heard God say very clearly, I don't care what you wear. I'm your father, not your mother. (laughs) You have a brain, child. Use it. But along the way, there's a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. It'll keep your heart soft. He will correct you. He will talk to you. God, how we want to hear your voice. How we want to hear your voice. Those who hardened their heart couldn't enter into that place of rest. Third, verses 12 and 13, we need to encourage one another daily. Oh, oh yes, hallelujah. That's why I have Facebook. I'm there to encourage one another. No, I am there to point out to all the morons how moronic they are in this moronic world. That's why I have Facebook. (laughs) Do you know that you will become like what you communicate? And if you're constantly cursing the darkness before long, you will become the darkness. What you're confessing out of your mouth is what you will become. Sinful and unbelieving hearts cannot respond to God. What goes on in your heart dictates what you're able to hear from God. And sin and unbelief deafen you to the voice of God. But when we encourage one another daily, beginning of verse 12, when we encourage one another daily, it does something for us. And this word encourage, watch, when this word encourage is the Greek word para kaleo. What does that mean? It means para alongside of kaleo to call. It means one called alongside to help. Do you know what the Holy Spirit is called in scripture? Para kaleo, the paraclete, the one come alongside to help. What should we desire to be? The Bible says to covet to prophesy you should desire to be the voice of God to the people around you every day that you live and bring a word from God for them we ought to have that voice in this world and if you want to hear the voice of God start speaking the word of God into your world and into the lives of others and be a blessing to them to encourage and build up I, I, it, it's why we're here If you want to keep your heart hard, (laughs) just keep talking about all the junk. Listen, we all know it's bad, right? How many know it's bad? We all know it's bad. How many of you are tired of COVID? (laughs) There was a big I am back there somewhere. How many of you are tired of quarantine and isolation? How many are tired of the lies and the misinformation and all all that's happening out there and Yeah, I'm tired of it all. But if all you talk about are the things you're tired of, you will reinforce that spirit on yourself. You need to try to parakaleo, come along someone and encourage them. So I just feel like, I know if I come down off here, the back up there can't see me and that might be what you're hoping for, but... If I came alongside Barry, put my arm around him and said, doesn't this, isn't this world stink? Yeah, it stinks. Isn't this terrible what's happening in the government? Yeah, it's terrible. And we went on and on for a couple hours. When we walked away, we're both going to be worse off than we started. But if I say, what's God done in your life today? And I'll tell you, Barry, I pick you out because you'll always have a story. This is one thing I know about Barry. He will always have a story of something God's doing in his heart that will bless me. If you're in a negative place, just get alongside this brother for a little while and you'll walk a little higher. He will encourage you. And when he starts to encourage you and you respond and encourage back and you're parakaleo, you're coming alongside each other to encourage one another in the faith. Do you know what happens? You'll start walking a little taller. Your faith will be a little stronger. You'll feel a little better than you did before you started. And I'm not saying you can't talk about the reality 
realities of what's going on. There are times we need to process that. But if you want to keep your heart soft, then do something to bless somebody with your words every day. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be spiritual. Some of you know that I like to roast coffee. I enjoy, <laughs> I do enjoy roasting coffee and I enjoy a good cup of coffee. It goes really well with pecan pie, but that's another story. <laughs> so someone asked me if I'd roast some coffee that they wanted to give to a friend. So I said, sure. So I roasted coffee and uh, gave it to this person to give to a friend that was also a friend of mine. How many are still with me? I know that's kind of convoluted. And didn't hear anything about it. I thought, well, I must not have liked it. And then I got a text. I said, Pastor Gary, this is the best coffee I'd ever had. At that point, I don't even care if it's true. <laughs> it, I couldn't believe, Pastor Tim, how that made my day. I, I blessed somebody. There's so much of my life, and you... And I'm not going into those details, but there's so many times the devil will pile up attacks on me and I feel like a complete loser. Why am I even getting up today? I battle that. But all it takes. All it takes is somebody to be the Holy Spirit to me. And communicate life to me. A simple word of encouragement. A simple word of blessing. Do you want your life to be better? Then bless the lives of others. Because that outflow of encouraging will also be what you will become. I have never once found myself encouraging someone that I felt lessened by that. Whenever I have encouraged someone, I have felt blessed by that. I'm talking about how to not have a hard heart. Encourage one another daily. What if we decided this year, and I'm not into resolutions because we do those and then we don't do them, but what if we made a commitment that I'm going to try every day to find somebody to bless? I have a friend who will occasionally text me and, and, you know, tell me I'm a champion. I love you, brother. I'm encouraging you. And again, I don't even care if it's true. It just encourages to have someone say something nice. What if we use Facebook that way? What if we use Twitter that way? What if we use uh, all the other social media platforms that way to make sure that at least once every day I encourage somebody? What would happen to our church? I know that we're isolated and small groups are hard to do right now and we, we're going to find a way around that. But what if you didn't care anymore about whether the church made it happen? You just decided you're going to be a Berean encourager. I'm going to make sure I encourage somebody every day. I promise you, it'll be the antidote to what ails you. It'll keep your heart soft if you encourage one another daily. Not weekly, but daily. To encourage somebody. Encourage somebody. Because, verse 13, sin is a deceiver. So that none of you may be hardened. Look at that. By sin's deceitfulness. What will keep you from being hardened by sin's deceitfulness? Well, I'm praying and fasting. I'm calling down the devil and I'm throwing him into the pit. What will keep you from being hardened by sin's deceitfulness is blessing people around you. Be the voice of encouragement. And last, number four, verses 14 to 19. I don't, I don't know that there's any way that I can emphasize this as strongly as I feel it this morning. Hold your convictions firmly. Hold your convictions firmly. It brings us back in verse 14 that we have come to share in Christ. We, are, we share together in the house. We share together in the family. We share together in Christ. This whole sense of community permeates chapter 3. We share in this together, not just individually, but corporately, not just personally, but as a group, as the body, in a mystical union with Christ. 
So we have to hold our convictions firmly to the end. Hold on tightly to the things that you believe. There are some things that we should not welcome in our hearts. I do not believe that you have to check your brains at the door to be a child of God. I believe in investigation. I believe in pursuing the scriptures. But child of God, listen to me. There are some things that shouldn't live in your house. Things that challenge your faith should not be allowed to live in your house. Things that create question about the integrity of God should not be allowed to live in your house. In Christian circles, we call it presuppositional apologetics. I believe that this word is true, and I don't care what garbage you throw in my front yard. I'm not allowing your doubt and skepticism to get in my house and stand on the outside because I believe that this is true. Well, what if you're wrong? Oh, no, no, don't even, don't even go there. I've lived this for a lot of years. And I've walked it, and I've tried it, and I've proven it, and I've tested it. And on the lowest valley I've walked, he's been there. On the highest mountaintop I've stood, he's been there. He's been there in the quiet times, the loud times, the exciting times, the boring times. And don't you tell me it isn't real. Don't you tell me it isn't true. I'm not giving you a chance to bring that garbage into my house. Don't let it come into who you are. Because that's how it started in the garden. Did God really say? Did God really say? Hold fast to your convictions. Hold them firmly. A generation, watch, was kept out of the promised land because of the unbelief of their parents. Now I'm going to read to you in this conclusion the scriptures to catch what the author of Hebrews is talking about. Watch this. When they reached the valley of Eskel, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole. I want you to put that picture in your mind right now. There's concrete, hard evidence of the blessing of God. They're carrying one cluster of grapes on a pole between two men. That is a big cluster of grapes. They carried pomegranates and figs. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly, showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into this land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. Now I'm going to tell you something. Always believe the fruit. Always believe the fruit. Don't believe the problem. Believe the fruit. What is producing fruit? They said, the people who live are powerful. Their cities are fortified, very large. Caleb silenced the people and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they'd explored. The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there of great size. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. That night all the people of the community raised their voices of the assembly, wept aloud. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron, the whole assembly. If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children would be taken as plunder. It would be better if we went back to Egypt. Why? And the Lord says to Moses after he intercedes for them, because God's going to wipe them out. But God said to Moses, I've forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, not one of the men who saw my glory and my miraculous signs will enter in. And you will wander 40 years in the desert till that generation dies. They couldn't enter in because of unbelief. Why? Because they ignored the fruit and they believed the report. When the fruit doesn't match the report, 
believe the fruit. I can't answer all the questions this world has to ask, and I can't answer all the idiots that are in the media saying things that are just mean and hateful and hurtful. <sighs> but I go to my closet and I start looking at the fruit. Where did we find the grapes? Where did we find the figs? Where did we find the milk and honey? I'm going to believe. Is anyone hearing me right now? I'm going to believe the fruit. I'm not believe in the news. I'm not believing in the media. I'm going to believe the fruit. And I'm going to hold fast to that confession of my faith. I'm going to hold firmly. Because those who don't hold firmly to faith in the days that are ahead are going to die in the wilderness. Do you want to keep your heart soft? Do you want to keep it tender before God? You need to put your mind on Jesus. You need to learn to hear his voice. You need to encourage somebody every day and then hold what you believe tightly and don't let anybody take it away. Listen to me. Someone needs to hear this this morning. It's like it's burning in my heart right now. You're in a place of indecision. Believe the fruit. Stop believing the reports. Look to the fruit. and You'll find the place where God has set his blessing. Let's stand together. Believe the fruit. What produces fruit? So Pastor Nathan's going to lead us in a moment. And some years ago, I, was at a, I took a class at the seminary working on my master's degree. And, and uh, there was a pastor from Singapore who had us do something really, really odd. And we're not going to do this this morning. I want to illustrate it, and then I want to encourage you to do something as we close. He had us all get in a room and begin to worship and write down what God spoke to us. First time it didn't work because of all the distractions, the whole story there. But we came apart for a time of worship. What is God speaking? And as we, as we began to share what God had pressed on our heart, it was confirmed by others who were saying almost the same thing. I believe that God has a word for this body this morning that we should all hear. He also has a word for you that only you need to hear. So rather than just worshiping, while you can do it while you're singing. God can speak through a song, and we're going to sing in a moment. Can we just begin the experiment? God, I want to hear your voice. I want to hear what you have to say. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. <sighs> Make that your prayer every day. Pastor Nathan, lead us. And let's just ask God for a minute if he would speak to us. Speak to us, Lord. We're listening.